Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Hong Kong, 1950. Ah shit, the voice yelled from under the blanket. A neatly polished boot kicked the bundle under the blanket again. Let me be. Oh my head. What hit me? The voice growled from under the blanket again. I am afraid it was that whiskey river that you tried to drain last night, old boy. Captain Jeffrey Chambers said. Where am I? The voice asked. Oh, you are in jail, old sport. I am afraid that you caused a bit of a fuss last night, made rather a mess at one of our favorite watering holes and all that. The commissioner of British police stationed in Hong Kong replied. How did I get here? The voice asked. Captain Chambers stood next to the jailhouse bunk in full dress uniform as he said, Well, one of my chaps had to bop you on the head before they could collect you. It took three of my men to get you in the back of the wagon, as you see. Ah shit, what did he hit me with? The voice moaned sorrowfully. Captain Chambers began, Buck up old boy, you'll live. But I am afraid that you will have to pay a bit of a fine as well as the damages which you caused. The owner of the bar is screaming bloody murder, you see, and he, well you know. Slowly the man on the jail cell bunk pulled the blanket down from over his head. Colonel Samuel Kincaid, United States Marines, retired, looked up at the ceiling and belched. Captain Chambers said, That's a good fellow. Now then, your man is in my office waiting for you. He's made your bail, and you can be on your way. However, you will have to come back to pay the damages at the hearing. Sam asked, Chung Lo is here? Captain Chambers replied, Yes, indeed. I say, Wherever did you meet such a brute of a man? Sam answered, Ah well, it was when I was flying P-40s in China for the Flying Tigers. One day we were setting up an early warning post in one of the outlying villages when my group came under attack by Japanese commandos. At that time, Chung was a Chinese underground fighter. I guess it was just dumb luck. He was about to be executed by the Japanese when I came storming into their camp with my Tommy gun blazing. Since then, he has dedicated his life to me. I mean that he thinks that I saved his life, and he thinks that he owes his life to me. In China it's that way. When a person saves your life, you then owe that person a debt of gratitude. Since then, he has dedicated his life to me as my protector. Then when America entered the war, we were separated. I went back to the States to reclaim my commission in the Marines. After the war, we both somehow landed up here. I guess he sought me out, and we have been together ever since. Chambers replied, I say, that's quite a story. Sam began to arise from the bunk. Watch your step old boy. These old Chinese jails have low ceilings. Don't bump your head when you get up from there. Chambers chuckled as he exited the jail cell. Very funny. Sam retorted. Standing to his full height, Sam made an imposing figure. Years in the United States Marine Corps had made Sam big and brawny. His usually clear blue eyes were clouded with the effects of a monster hangover. His head pounded such that he pressed both of his hands upon his head. Then he ran his fingers through his closely cut black hair. You wee that was a bad one. Sam said to himself. Sam brushed his rumpled and torn gray suit off with his hands as he walked to Jeffrey Chambers' office. Since this wasn't the first time that he had been a guest of the British police, Sam knew the way. In fact, Sam and Jeffrey were old friends. In these days of unrest in Hong Kong, the Americans and the British found it advantageous to take care of each other. There was a civilian police force consisting of mostly Chinese. But when the shit hit the fan, it was the British who had the real authority and final say over things. Wearing the traditional Chinese costume which consisted of a black silk tunic and pants, Chung Lo said, Why do you disgrace me this way? Sam replied, Stop being a mother hen. I'm all right. Chung began again. You drink too much. You always get in trouble when you drink too much. What was it this time? Was it another woman? You know that Hong Kong is a very dangerous place. There is all manner of cutthroats here. One night when I'm not there to watch your back, someone will slit your throat. Sam waved his hand through the air. I should never have taught you to speak English. All right. I am sorry, Mother Hen. Come on, let's get out of here. The Mother Hen thing was a running joke between the two men. As far as Mother Hens were concerned, Chung Lo didn't fit the mold. Mother Hens are supposed to be little nervous individuals who are afraid of their own shadows. Chung Lo, on the other hand, was a big man. He towered over Sam's six-foot frame by as many as six inches. He was packing about 270 pounds of hard muscle. In addition, he was a master at hand-to-hand -hand combat. He had a habit of crushing small objects in his large, powerful hands to intimidate his adversaries. His long brown hair and his oriental features made him a very believable bone crusher. Jeffrey said, There you are old sport. Ah, now then, you two run along. I don't want to see either of you anymore today. I especially do not want to see you, Sam, anymore today. You see, I have a date with a bit of all right, 
if you know what I mean. Cheery by old boy. Sam was dismissed curtly by his old friend. And that was the way the day began for Sam. In large, emerald green letters, the sign over Sam's office depicted sea dragons. The sign boasted a pair of dragons breathing fire into the air. A green dragon was placed on each side of the sign, such as to bracket the emerald green letters. The background was black for contrast. In small green letters were the words, Kincaid Enterprises. Sam had come to Hong Kong to start a shipping company. He gambled upon the fact that after the war the Chinese would need all manner of goods relative to the reconstruction. In addition, China had been taken over by the communists who closed the country's markets to the West. Also, the British controlled Hong Kong, which made it the only free market in the region. To Sam's way of thinking, this was an outstanding opportunity for the right guy who wasn't afraid to take a risk or two. Sam knew something also. He knew that when markets are closed, a black market arises quickly to emulate a free market. In a situation like this, the right guy could get rich quickly. Sam had set about buying a fleet of seagoing junks. His first purchase was a large seagoing junk which he named Hornet. He and Chung began running the blockade set up by the communists. It was very risky business, but it was very profitable. The shipping company grew quickly bolstered by the profits from the black market goods. Along the way, Sam had become a sort of hero among the boat people who lived in the harbors. The Hornet was always a welcome sight when it sailed into the harbor. Sam was smart enough to know that favors placed in the right place would bring good returns. So, what was it all about last night? Chung asked as they sat in Sam's office at the shipping company. Sam still in his ripped gray suit replied. She said that she wasn't married. Chung, and you believed her? Sam, well she wasn't wearing a ring. Chung, what else did she tell you? Sam, well alright. I had a bit too much to drink, and I guess that my judgment was a little slippery. I saw the mark on her finger where she usually wore her ring. A lot of the wealthy tourists pull that trick. They want to have a night on the town without hubby. Besides, she was a knockout. She had these big beautiful eyes, and she had an amazing body. You know that I'm a sucker for a big beautiful blonde. Chung, so what else? Sam, well we were sitting all the way in the back where nobody can see you. I had my arms around her, and we were making out. She started saying things like, why don't you take me somewhere and screw me? Then the shit hit the fan. Before I knew it, she is saying, my husband is here. You got to do something. He can't find me like this. Well, I figured that the only thing to do was to start a fight. I told her to run out through the kitchen when the fight started. I hated to do it, but I grabbed some sailor who was on the town with his buddies. Then, before I knew it, the whole place turned into a free-for-all. Everybody was throwing punches. I was holding my own when the lights went out. I guess one of Jeffrey's men popped me on the head. Well, that's it. Chung sat and gave Sam a look of contempt. At that time, there was a knock on the door. Sam said, Chung see who is at the door. Chung opened the door to see a pretty woman with dark hair. At the sight of Chung, the black-eyed beauty stepped back in fright. She asked, Are you Sam Kincaid? Chung merely pointed at Sam. With trepidation, the tall, slender Eurasian stepped into the office. She asked, Are you Sam Kincaid? Sam replied while sitting at his desk, Yes, what can I do for you? I have come to make you a proposition. May I sit? Sam gestured her to sit. Sam began, Please forgive my appearance. It was a rough night. She said with a smile, Well, I wasn't going to compliment your tailor. Sam chuckled, I don't blame you. Is there something that I can do for you? The pretty woman took a look around Sam's office and said, Well, I can't compliment your interior decorator either. Sam's office was sparse. Its best attribute was the view of the harbor. The office contained a brown leather couch and a couple of sitting chairs. Sam said, Why don't you tell me your name? That's always a good place to start. She said, I'm Susie Benton. I am Lee Wong's stepdaughter. At that, Sam's attention was drawn up. A moment passed before Sam spoke. That name takes me all the way back to China when I was a member of the Flying Tigers. Susie said, I know. You see I received a letter from my stepsister telling me all about it. Sam asked, Where did you come from? Susie replied, I am an American. I was born in San Francisco. My mother was Lee Wong's first wife. I guess I should tell you the whole story. Sam said, Please do Miss Benton. I am very interested in what you have to say. Susie continued, Not long ago, I received a letter from my stepsister Jade. She told me that our father is being held for ransom by gangsters. I am not sure if you know that our father has become a very wealthy man in the Jade trade. Well, since the communists take over, things have changed drastically. Several groups of people have taken up the life of crime. These gangsters are not above kidnapping people for ransom. They are holding my father, 
and they are threatening my sister. They know that my sister is holding a fortune in Jade artifacts. It comes down to this Mr. Kincaid. My sister Jade wants you to help. She wants you to come to China to rescue her and our father. Sam fell back into his chair and let out a long low whistle. Then he said, holy shit. A long silence passed before anyone spoke. It was Chung who spoke. It is a debt of gratitude and honor. You must honor it. Susie asked, what is he talking about? Sam began, when I was a flying tiger, I was shot down. I bailed out and I soon found myself on the run. It was Lee Wong who took me in and hid me. Later, I was able to get back to my unit. If it wasn't for Lee's help, I probably would have been killed. Susie asked, so then, will you help? Another long silence passed. The two men seemed to be considering the proposition. There was a lot to consider. There was danger involved, and one or all of the participants may not make it back. Sam said after some consideration, I guess we are going for a sea voyage. Susie said, good, when can we get started? Quickly Sam said, hold on there. You're not going anywhere. This is no trip for a woman. You missy are going to stay right here in Hong Kong until we get back. Susie flurried, not on your life. I'm in this all the way. Remember these are my relatives. Chung agreed. She has a right to be there. Sam looked at Susie and said, You know that something like this is very dangerous. You could get hurt or worse. Susie retorted, I haven't come all this way to quit now. I am going all the way with you regardless of the consequences. The thing about a junk is that they are all built to traditional specifications. Some are small and some are large, but all junks are seaworthy crafts. The people who build junks have had no need to change the design. Once they found the design which worked, they have adhered to that design for a hundred years or more. Another nice thing about a junk is that they all look alike. This is a handy thing for a guy who intends to sail into forbidden waters. Sam's junk sailed out of Hong Kong Harbor with enough crew and provisions for an extensive sea voyage. Susie asked, Why do you call this ship the Hornet? Sam answered, It's because it has a bit of a stinger in its tail. You see in my business a guy needs a little bit of an edge. Susie, I'm not sure just what you mean, but I'll take your word for it. It was that time of year when the days are hot and the nights aren't any cooler. The humidity made the air wet and sticky. The sun beat down upon the sea as to make the sea glassy and moody. Under these conditions, storms could come up suddenly. It could be a sunny day full of blue sky, and in a short time, clouds could roll across the horizon. When that happened, you were in for a hell of a time. Sam and Chung were experienced sailors now, and they knew these waters as well as this coastline. They never underestimated the danger of sailing these waters. The voyage was underway, and the crew settled down into a daily routine. Because of the heat most of the crew had stripped down to lightweight clothing. On the second day, Susie appeared upon deck, wearing a red bathing suit and a white sun hat. Sam became very aware of her presence. Although she was tall and slender, Susie filled out her bathing suit nicely. Her raven black hair made a pleasant contrast to the red bathing suit which she was wearing. As they were standing on the after deck, Chung remarked, I have seen that look before. Sam replied, she has a nice pair of tits. Chung, her hips are not too bad either. The two men made their appraisal of Susie's assets, and she came out to be viewed as a worthwhile piece of meat. Sam knew that before this voyage was over, Sam and Susie would be more than business partners. Susie, on the other hand, was aware of Sam. Dressed in his captain's cap, t-shirt, and shorts which revealed his rippling muscles, Sam was a very attractive man, and Susie noticed every part of him. The flirting began that night at dinner. Sam, we are going to be on this boat for some time, Miss Benton. Why don't we bring it down to a first name basis? Susie, well all right. You can call me Susie, and I'll call you Sam. And let's not forget Mr. Lowe. I will call you Chung, like Sam does. If that's all right? Chung, that will be just fine Susie. Sam, now that is over let's have a drink to get us in the spirit of things. The night's dinner was a success. All three diners had a very pleasant time getting to know each other. Sam accompanied Susie to her cabin. Susie knew that Sam was going to kiss her, but she didn't mind. All through dinner Susie was thinking of what it would be like to have this big handsome man in her bed. She had made her mind up that that would happen sooner than later. The narrow corridor accommodated Sam's move. Standing outside of Susie's cabin, Sam leaned up against her and kissed her hotly. Susie kissed him back. Susie broke the kiss and said, Hold on there sailor. Let's take this a little slower. I'll see you in the morning. Until then, you better cool down mister. Sam stood back and he replied, Yes I will see you in the morning but I don't think that I'll be any cooler then. The cabin door closed behind Susie, and Sam stood in the corridor. He stood there for a moment, as if he was trying to make up his mind. 
He then walked away. The next morning Susie arose with a bit of a kink in her neck due to the small bunk. The Hornet wasn't a luxury liner. It was a working cargo ship more suited to working men, not a pretty tall Eurasian woman. Space is limited on a vessel like the Hornet. Sam's cabin was the largest, and it is usually reserved for the captain. The first mate's cabin was occupied by Chung. Susie's cabin was even smaller. The crew had their own quarters arranged in a communal way, and there was a small mess hall which was used by all. Susie arose to realize that it was about mid-morning. The hot and sticky weather made sleeping difficult, and Susie wasn't fully awake. In addition, Susie needed a wash to cleanse the sweat away before she could attempt some brunch. She casually put on a pair of blue denim trousers and a white short-sleeve shirt. Having done that, she went looking for something to eat. Sam and Chung were sitting at the mess hall table. They seemed to be looking at some charts, and each man had a grim look about them. So intent they were neither man noticed Susie as she entered the mess hall. Susie said with a cheery voice, Hi you guys, what's up? Sam acknowledged her, You had better get something to eat now because it's likely to get a bit rough later. Susie knew now that something was definitely up. A crewman entered the mess hall and spoke to Chung in Chinese. Then in turn, Chung said to Sam, The barometer just dropped again. With a puzzled look upon her face, Susie asked, Will one of you guys please tell me what is going on? Sam voiced his concern, Typhoon. Susie knew what a typhoon was, and she knew that it was bad business especially on a ship out in the open ocean. Susie, but it's a sunny day outside. Sam gestured, Come with me. The three of them went up on deck. The day was clear, blue, and hot. Sam led them to the port side as he gazed out to the horizon. Sam said to Susie as he pointed, It will come from that direction. It will come fast, and it will look like hell. These waters are known for these quick and unexpected storms. They usually don't last long, but they play hell when they come. Susie understood fully now. She asked, What are we going to do? Sam began, We are going to make a run for it. There is a group of islands not far from here. Most of them are not inhabited, and one or two of them don't even appear on any map. Chung and I found one of those uncharted islands which were perfect for our purposes. It has a lagoon just big enough to hide the hornet in it, and so we built a shelter there. If we are lucky, we will be there before the storm hits. For right now, you better prepare yourself for some rough weather. I expect the seas to get very rough soon. I hope that you brought your seasickness medicine because you may need it soon. Sam turned to Chung and said, Set a course for No Name Island. We will ride it out there. Chung then went off as he barked out orders in Chinese to the crew. Instantly, the men became a flurry of activity. Susie felt the hornet haul over as the ship came about. Men were running here and there as they made the ship answer to their commands. Sam said to Susie, We are heading to Bongo Straits. If we hit it just right, we will have the wind at our back. Don't you worry. The Hornet is a sturdy old gal, and she has been through this before. Susie wasn't worried until Sam started talking about the ship as a woman. She had read somewhere that when men start talking about a ship as a woman, it usually means that those men are scared shitless. The day proved to be just what Sam expected. The clouds came from out of the horizon and the winds picked up strongly. The seas grew more unruly, and it made navigation more difficult. As Sam predicted, the wind was at their back as they entered Bongo Straits. By now, the Hornet had a bone in her teeth, and she was making good time. It was late afternoon when they spotted No Name Island. Susie could tell that Sam was relieved as the island appeared off their starboard bow. Susie had come up on deck to watch the men as they prepared to set the anchor. Sam and Chung were barking out orders to the crew, and the men were moving with practice speed. The Hornet was sort of aimed directly at the lagoon. As they approached, the men scrambled about to drop the sails. The engine was ignited, and the Hornet came under power. As they entered the lagoon, the Hornet made a sort of a left turn as if it had swerved. The stern came around, and the Hornet came to a stop. The starboard anchor dropped with a splash. The engine was then reversed, and the Hornet moved backward and to the left. Then it moved forward again. The port anchor dropped, and the engine was stopped. As Susie watched the maneuver, Sam came to her side. He said, It's called double hooking. It's a storm rig. The men will run a line off the stern and moor it to the shore. This way the ship will not break loose under the force of the waves. Susie remarked, I'm very impressed. Sam said, Welcome to No Name Island. I'll have the rowboat in the water shortly, and we can go ashore. We will sleep in the shelter tonight while the crew will stay aboard. That evening, the three sailors went ashore. What Sam called a shelter was in fact a World War II Quonset hut. Sam remarked, I bet you thought that we were going to be sleeping in a hut made of palm fronds. Susie asked, How in the world did you get it here? 
Sam replied, Oh, getting it here was easy. We just loaded it into the cargo hold piece by piece and carried it here in the Hornet. It wasn't too bad. I bought everything at a war surplus sale. Once it was here, I hired a gang of guys to construct it. I am afraid that there isn't a lot of privacy, but we'll rig something up for you. Susie asked, Is there modern plumbing? Sam, Well, no, you will have to use the outhouse, but there is running water and electricity. Susie, How did you manage that? Sam, Well, the electricity is provided by a generator, and there is a well for fresh water. It's really not too bad once you get used to it. The island was like most tropical islands. It was small, rugged, and rainforest covered most of the island. Sam's compound was located up the trail into a flat place overlooking the lagoon. It was a very pleasant place, if you didn't mind the fact that it was in the middle of nowhere and there were no people. Once inside, Chung set about setting up housekeeping. He started the cook stove and began preparing dinner. Outside the storm was making itself known. The wind came up forcefully, and it began to rain. At dinner Sam said to Susie, It's going to be a rough night. We will be safe in here. Susie remarked, Listen to that wind. It is really howling out there now. The typhoon was full upon the island, and one could see the palm trees bending from the force of the wind. The rain was coming down hard, and the volcanic soil of the island was turning into mud. Brilliant flashes of lightning zipped through the night, and the crack of thunder was deafening. Sam rigged up a sleeping area for Susie. He ran some rope across one corner of the hut and draped some blankets over the line as to give Susie some privacy. Sam, there, all the comforts of home. Susie laughed, not quite, but it will do. Throughout the storm Sam Chung and Susie remained in the shelter safe from the storm. It was close living, but the three managed well. All the time, Sam and Susie were becoming more interested in each other. Special looks passed between Sam and Susie. Conversations took on an unspoken meaning. The heat which passed between Sam and Susie became apparent. The storm raged for three days and nights. The fourth day brought the sun as it rose in the east. It was a clear, warm, and pleasant tropical morning. Susie arose early, and she decided to take a walk. Finding a trail, she followed it into the interior of the island. Her spirits were high. Her thoughts were about Sam. She knew that it was just a matter of time now. She had made her mind up. When Sam came to her, she wouldn't reject him. Throughout those nights in the shelter, she thought of Sam as he lay just on the other side of the blanket partition. She wondered if he was thinking about her. As she walked, Susie came upon a little stream containing a waterfall which dropped into a large pond. It was an enchanting place. The sun filtered down through the trees as it caused sparkling highlights upon the water. The song of tropical birds could be heard as they fluttered throughout the trees. Brightly colored flowers were everywhere. She inhaled their fragrance and she found their perfume to be intoxicating. She placed her hand into the water and found it warm and inviting. Without hesitation, Susie stripped off her clothes and stepped under the little waterfall. The water was exhilarating, and she was filled with joy. A pretty smile appeared upon her face when she saw Sam approaching. Sam had come looking for her. Since she didn't seem to be down at the lagoon, Sam thought that she must have gone exploring. He guessed that she found the path which led into the forest. Sam stopped and looked. What he saw was a thing of beauty. Susie stood on a rock under the waterfall. Her long black hair was wet and shiny. Her body deflected the falling water into the air. As it flew into the air, the water droplets were caught by the sunlight, and they turned into sparkling diamonds. With a come-here look on her face, Susie looked at Sam. Then she dove into the pond. After surfacing, she turned to Sam. Come on, what are you waiting for? You know that you have been wanting to screw me for the last week. Well, now is your chance, big boy. Susie said playfully. Sam stripped off his clothes, and he walked to the edge of the pond. He stood there for a moment, just taking in her beauty. They spent the entire morning making love. Their love making was hot and intense. After their lust subsided, the two lovers lay upon the ground holding each other. Sam spoke first. We had better get back to the shelter. It's time we were on our way again. Susie cooed. Just do me one more time before we go back. So, Sam did as Susie requested. He summoned up what strength he had left, and he pleasured her one more time. On the way back to the shelter, Sam was quiet. Then also throughout lunch Sam seemed distant. Susie sensed that something was bothering Sam. Susie asked, What is the matter? Sam replied, You should have told me. Susie, told you what? Sam, you know. You should have told me that you were a virgin. Susie, is that it? You're feeling guilty? Sam, I took advantage of you. Susie, now you just wait a moment. Nobody took advantage of anybody. I wanted you to screw me, mister. 
Do you think that you have ruined me? Is that it? Well, to begin, I'm over 21, and I have a mind of my own. Let me tell you something, buddy. I never expected to live the life of the devoted wife. That crap is for white women. White women and their religious bull should have never had anything to do with me. Remember, I am half Chinese. In our beloved country, half of anything is as good as nothing. In our beloved country, a woman is treated like a bitch if she isn't a virgin when she gets married. You listen to me right now. I couldn't give a flying shit about the whole thing. So, don't you go around feeling sorry for me. And don't you ruin what we did. It was beautiful. Susie was now visibly angry. Sam was surprised. I didn't know that you felt that way. Susie, well, yes I do. Now, you listen. I like you a lot, Sam. You are a great guy, and I couldn't have given it to a better man. Whatever happens from now on, we will always have that. Do we have an understanding? Sam nodded in agreement. There was an understanding between the two, and it made Sam feel much better. Chung approached the table. We should make some plans. Sam, you are right. What are your ideas? Chung, you know that where we are going is an unfriendly place. We just can't walk right up to these guys and ask them to turn Lee over to us. Sam, you are not just fooling. My guess is that whoever has Lee are a bunch of badasses. They know about Susie's sister too. They know that there is a lot of money involved, and they are going to want their share. Susie asked, So, what are we going to do? Sam, we are going to do the unexpected. I have been thinking it over, and I think that I have a plan. Both Chung and Susie said in unison, What? Sam began, According to Susie's sister, they are holding Lee in a stronghold at the edge of the desert. They aren't going to expect anyone to come at them from out of the desert. That's probably why they built their stronghold where they did. That's their back door, and that's their weakness. Chung, you know this. There is an inlet to the north. It leads to a river. At this time, Chung interjected, Ah shit, you don't mean Rocky Bottom and Hell's Gate, do you? Susie asked, What is Rocky Bottom and Hell's Gate? Chung replied, It is twelve ways of death. The bottom there is full of rocks which can rip the belly out of a ship in a heartbeat. Hell's Gate is a line of rocks which stick up like a row of teeth. It is located at the mouth of that river which he is talking about. He's crazy. Susie asked again. Why is he crazy Chung? Chung, he thinks that he can navigate through the bay and the river without wrecking the hornet. Susie, why does he think that? Chung, we went there to chart the bay and the river. He figured that it was a good place to run away from the gunboats which enforced the blockade on that part of the coast. The gunboats can't get through there without having their bottoms ripped out. Susie, gunboats? Nobody told me anything about gunboats. Sam spoke. I told you at the very start that this is going to be dangerous. Susie asked, what is this all about? I mean, why are there gunboats? Sam, you see, the communists don't allow free trade in their country. The people can't get things that they need or want. So, we help them get what they want. The government, on the other hand, takes a different view of things. It's just all politics. Chung said, why don't we just sail into the port they're disguised as Chinese fishermen? Sam considered, well, maybe that's not a bad plan. It would be a lot easier than going through Rocky Bottom and Hell's Gate, and the trek through the desert would be hard. Chung said, the port there is well developed. We would be able to buy all the supplies which we will need. Susie asked, how do we disguise ourselves? Sam, we put into one of the coastal fishing villages and buy some fishing nets. We just rig them around on the Hornet. Then, we play dress up, and we are fishermen. Susie added, I don't know about this kind of stuff, but I think that the simplest plan is the best one. Both Chung and Sam agreed. The three adventurers then gathered up their belongings and returned to the Hornet. The mooring was taken in, and the anchors were raised and stowed. The Hornet came under power as it made way to the open sea. Once out of the lagoon, the Hornet came under sail, and they were on their way. The Hornet put into the port of a small fishing village as they planned. There was the usual assortment of vessels set about the harbor. In villages like these, Significant amounts of the people live on their boats in the harbor as they fish for their daily food. The hornet navigated among the boats and fish nets as it made its way to a mooring. Several days had passed since they took shelter at No Name Island. The hornet came into the harbor on a mild breeze late in the afternoon. The weather was hot and sticky, and the afternoon sun beat down upon the water making it appear glassy. The people were busy at their daily tasks, and the sounds of everyday living could be heard everywhere. Harbors like these are actually the villages. That is to say, the people live and work on their boats, and they go ashore only for needed supplies. Susie stood upon the deck taking in the sights, sounds, and aromas. This was her first look of mainland China. 
This wasn't a picture out of a book. It was the real thing. Susie was thrilled to see the land of her father. Sam came to her and said, We will stay aboard tonight, and tomorrow we will go ashore for our supplies. They went below and prepared for dinner. At dinner, they talked about the plan. They had decided to sneak into the port as a fishing boat. Then they would travel the river. It was time for Susie to contribute to the plan. Sam was strongly against letting her come on the voyage. To his way of thinking, it would be dangerous enough. And with having a woman along, it would be more difficult. Susie insisted. To ensure her place in the rescue, she had held back the important information needed to make the assault on the stronghold. She had told them just enough to give them a general idea as to what they would be up against. Susie's stepsister had drawn up detailed plans of the stronghold. Susie had received a package in the mail one day, and that was when it all began. Her stepsister Jade Wong was in trouble, and she was asking for Susie's help. The package also contained a detailed letter telling her to go to Hong Kong and find Sam Kincaid. Now, here she was. Sam asked, Do you have a map of the stronghold? Susie began, Yes, I have it in my head. Get a sheet of paper, and we will draw a sketch of the place. So that's what they did. Sitting at the table in the little mess hall of the Hornet, Sam, Chung, and Susie began to make the final plan. Susie started, you already know where we are going. We are going to Tang Su province on the southern coast. It's out in the middle of nowhere far away from civilization. There is a bay which serves as a harbor not unlike this one which we are moored in now. There is a river which goes inland. It is big enough for a ship like this to travel on. The river travels all the way up to the mountains, but we aren't going that far. Sam, you were right. They built this place on the edge of the desert. The river is the best way to get there. In fact, it is the only way to get supplies up there. The stronghold is about 50 miles inland from the river. There is a dirt road which leads to the stronghold. Being where it is, I don't think that there will be a lot of guards. Susie noticed that Sam and Chung were looking at each other in a curious way. Susie asked, Okay, what is it? Why are you guys looking like that? Sam answered, There is only one reason why these guys would build a stronghold all the way out there. Susie asked, Why? Sam, did your sister mention anything about opium? Susie, no, she just said that these guys were some real bad roughnecks. The leader is someone named Zing Fu. So, now what next? Sam said, let's see the layout of the place. If it is a poppy farm, we may be able to use that to our advantage. Susie began again. There are four buildings. One looks like a barn. One looks like a bunkhouse. And one is a private residence. The last one is a big square building. She said that the man who gave Jade the message wasn't sure what it was used for. Chung asked, what man? Susie replied, Jade said that Lee was able to bribe one of the guards. He was able to smuggle a message out, and the message made its way to Jade. The man was just a messenger. Lee said that he is being held captive in a room in the residence. Sam said, the big square building must be where they process the opium. We will not be concerned with that. All we have to do is to get into the residence and snatch Lee. Chung asked, how are you going to do that? Sam, there will be at least one truck. They need something to transport the opium to the river for export. We will hide and wait for the truck. When it comes, we grab it, and we have our ride to the farm. We sneak in and snatch Lee and make a break for it. That was the plan. The three participants agreed that it was their only chance. Once the planning and dinner was over, Sam and Susie went up onto the main deck to enjoy the evening. The night was warm and fragrant. Susie was aware of the gentle sway of the hornet as she rode on her anchor. The harbor was dotted by lantern lights provided by the numerous sampans which were moored in the harbor. The lanterns flickered like so many fireflies in the dark. Susie said, It's beautiful here. Look at all those people just living and working on those little boats. It's all so very alive. Oh, look over there. Do you see the rowboat? Isn't that Mr. Lowe? Where is he going? Sam replied, Well, he is going to visit a relative. Susie, now, hold on there. You don't expect me to believe that, do you? Sam said with a smile upon his lips, he's going to get some feminine comfort. Do you see that sampan over there? Susie asked, which one? Sam pointed, the one with the red lantern on the bow. Susie looked out onto the harbor to see several sampans with red lanterns on their bows, but there are a lot of them. Sam explained, in a poor place like this, the families often put their daughters out for a source of income. This is just the way it is around here. It's not like back in the States. If these people don't make enough money, they go hungry. It's not a sin here. It's just a fact of life in villages like this. Susie said, so, he's going to visit a hooker. Sam replied, if I know Chung, he'll visit at least two of them before the night is over. It was true. 
Chung was on his way to visit a hooker. Two days later, the hornet left the fishing village. She made way at dawn as she headed out to sea. Her main deck was cluttered with fishing nets, making her look like a fishing boat. It had taken a day or so for Sam and Chung to buy the needed supplies. They had done a good job of disguising the hornet. They had to do a good job because where they were going wasn't going to be a picnic. Where they were going was a well-guarded section of mainland China's coast. They were headed south into gunboat country. These guys as Sam knew had a habit of shooting first and then asking questions later. Sam and Chung had been there on numerous occasions, and they had become experts at navigating these waters. They had used the fishing boat disguise before, and they had good success with it. This was one of the reasons why Sam chose a junk for his business. Since one junk looks pretty much like another one, it makes it easier to go places without being noticed. The only different thing about the hornet was the stinger in her tail. Sam and Susie stood upon the main deck of the hornet. The day was sunny, and the wind was good for sailing. The hornet was rolling under the influence of a heavy sea. Susie said to Sam, you look ridiculous in that outfit. It wasn't much of a difficulty for Chung to dress up like a Chinese peasant fisherman, but Sam did look strange considering his Caucasian features. In fact, they all looked like fishermen in their costumes. The ploy was this. If they encountered a gunboat, they were to stand upon the main deck and smile broadly while waving at the gunboat as it went sailing by to take a look. Sam sincerely hoped that it wouldn't be necessary, but he wasn't taking any chances. In the mess hall, Sam studied the map. Look here. Sam said to Susie. Susie was intent upon knowing what Sam was looking at. Sam indicated upon the map by pointing with his index finger, we are headed south. The hornet is here. We are taking a wide course around Rocky Bottom. We'll be out of sight of the coast. We shouldn't have any trouble way out here. The trouble starts when we get close to the coast about here. Susie looked closely at the point upon the map where Sam was pointing. Susie asked, isn't that where we're going? Sam nodded and explained, look at the coast here. All up and down the coast are these bays and inlets. Most of these inlets lead to a river which starts far inland in those mountains there. See here, there is the desert I mentioned. It is what they call a rain shadow desert. On the inland side of the mountains, it rains. The wind carries the rain clouds to the inland slopes of the mountains. Then, the wind is compressed as it rises up and travels over the mountains. As the wind comes down on the seaward side of the mountains, it compresses and becomes extremely dry and hot. This is what causes the desert. The desert is one of the reasons why the people who live there have turned to the sea for a living. That's one of the reasons why you will see a lot of fishing boats in this region. And this is the reason why we are disguised like a fishing boat. Susie nodded as she asked, which one of those rivers is the one we want? Sam resumed as he pointed at the map, that one. It makes its way almost to their front door. The hornet sailed a wide loop away from the coast. This was by design. Sam and Chung had set the course so that the hornet would enter hostile waters at sunset. From that position, they could sail straight into the bay under the cover of night. From there, it was a straight shot into the river. They would sail up the river to a mooring for the hornet. And that's just what they did. They slipped through the bay and the harbor under the cover of night without being discovered. As far as anyone knew, they were just some fishermen on their way home. The river was difficult to navigate in the dark, but they were excellent sailors. Aided by a favorable moon, Sam and Chung threaded their way up the river until they were forced to strike the sails and go to the engine. Using the engine, navigation was more manageable. In the bay, in the harbor, and in the mouth of the river, the hornet had to navigate around and through vessels of various sizes. Here at this part of the river traffic was minimal. This told them that they were getting close to their destination. As they traveled up the river, the port village gave way to open countryside. The more they traveled up the river, the more desolate the countryside became. They had traveled deep into the countryside now, and Sam could understand the reason why these guys built their stronghold here. It was like the Old West out here except that these guns slinging bad guys were Chinese. Sam found a good spot on the river, about one mile downriver from their destination. It was a perfect place to hide the hornet. As luck would have it, the river made a sort of a bend creating a cove. Sam backed the hornet into the cove and ordered the crew to set a fore and aft mooring. With her bow pointed toward the main channel of the river, the hornet was positioned for a quick getaway. The trouble was that they were parked on the wrong side of the river. This meant that they had to row the boat further to reach their destination. Also, it meant that they would be sitting ducks as they crossed the river on the way back. Other than that, the hornet was in perfect position and out of sight. Sam and Chung changed out of their fisherman clothes and got into their combat camouflage. Susie got into some warm outdoor clothes since her job was to stay with the rowboat until Sam and Chung came back with her stepfather. She wanted to go all the way to the stronghold with them, 
but Sam finally convinced her that it was too dangerous. The three armed themselves. Sam gave Susie a double-barrel 12-gauge shotgun and plenty of ammunition. Chung was already a weapon having turned himself into a martial arts master. However, he carried an M, one carbine as well as a commando knife. Across each shoulder was hung a bandolier of ammunition. Sam carried his old and trusty Thompson submachine gun, which he used when he was in China fighting for the Flying Tigers. He also strapped an Army Colt 45 to his hip just for the feel of it. The three set off in the rowboat. Chung rode while Susie sat in the stern. Sam sat in the prow his Tommy gun at the ready. The first rays of light appeared in the east. The morning was brisk, and the air smelled clear and fresh. The bow of the rowboat slapped against the current of the river as Chung pulled hard at the oars. Ahead Sam spotted a dock. Since it was early in the morning, Sam wasn't expecting anyone to be around. Moreover, the element of surprise was on their side. As far as these guys were concerned, Sam thought that they had to be thinking that anyone who came up here had to be absolutely crazy. Then, Sam thought to himself that perhaps they really were absolutely crazy doing this. Lee Wong had more or less had saved Sam's life when Sam got shot down while on a mission for the Flying Tigers. Lee hid Sam from the enemy, and he had helped Sam to return to his unit. Without Lee's help, Sam would had most likely been captured and killed by the enemy. It was a debt of honor. Sam was obliged to return the favor. Like the way that Sam and Chung had a bond, Sam and Lee had a bond as well. This was the way in China. A man honored his debts, or he lost face among his fellows. Sam was here to save Lee's life, and Sam would do just that or die trying. Sam pointed to a place on the bank of the river, just downriver from the dock. There they came ashore. Sam gave Susie her directions. You stay with the boat. If anyone comes, you open up with that double barrel. Don't hesitate. These guys are bad business. You make your way back to the Hornet. Then you get the hell out of here. I have left orders with the crew. They will take you back to Hong Kong. Susie interrupted. Wait a minute. What about you and Chung? Sam replied, You listen to me. If we aren't back here by tonight, you get the hell out of here. Susie knew what Sam meant. She knew that if they weren't back by nightfall, they weren't coming back at all. They pulled the rowboat onto a sandy bank and hit it as well as they could. Susie stood guard with her shotgun as Sam and Chung set off to find a ride to the stronghold. They stealthily made their way to the dock which they spotted on their way up the river. While hiding in the bushes, Sam appraised the situation. It wasn't much. The little landing consisted of a dock and a big shack. There were a few 55-gallon drums placed together along the shack, and there was what looked like an outhouse. There was a dirt road which led into the countryside. Other than that, there wasn't anything to see. It was scrubland. Sam wondered if there was anyone in the shack, and if there was a guard. There was only one way to find out. It was just after dawn, and anyone in the shack would most likely be asleep. Sam said to Chung, let's find out if anyone is home. Seeing no need for stealth, they just walked up to the front door of the shack with guns in full view. Chung slung his M, one onto his shoulder, and Sam holding it by the grip let his Tommy gun hang at his side. The two men stood outside the front door and knocked. The door opened slowly to reveal a drowsy man wearing nothing but his underpants. Speaking in Chinese, the man said, You are ah. The man never finished what he was going to say. With his huge hand, Chung grabbed the man by his right arm and using a cross-draw grip he pulled his commando knife and placed it to the man's throat. The man's eyes popped with fright. Pushing the man back into the shack, Chung and Sam entered. Sitting the man back onto his bunk, Chung began to question the man. While Chung interrogated the man in Chinese, Sam searched the shack for anything which may be useful. Chung said to Sam, he knows nothing. All he knows is someone will come and relieve him. Sam asked, ask him when. Chung replied, he says that someone is supposed to show up sometime this morning soon. Sam's search of the shack turned up nothing but an old rifle and a couple of opium pipes. It was apparent that the man was just a lowly lackey not worth their effort. They tied the man up and laid him upon his bunk as they waited for his relief. They made themselves comfortable inside the shack as they waited. After about an hour and hearing the sound of a truck, both Sam and Chung spring into action. Coming down the dirt road was an old two and a half ton truck. It looked like it was worse for the wear. Its canvas top which covered its loading bed was sun bleached and ripped in several places. During the war, these trucks were used for everything from carrying supplies to carrying troops. Like so much of the stuff these days, it probably was purchased as war surplus goods. Sam peered out of the door of the shack to see. He could see two men in the truck wearing work clothes. The truck pulled up in front of the shack and the men got out. Sam and Chung lay in wait for them. Chung stood to one side of the door of the shack and Sam stood to the other side. As the door of the shack opened, 
Sam and Chung pounced upon the men. To the first man who stepped into the shack, Chung delivered with his right hand a vicious blow to the back of the man's head. With one punch of Chung's powerful arm, the man just crumbled onto the floor. The second man, realizing what was happening, turned to run. Before the man could move, Sam grabbed him by his collar and pointed his Tommy gun at the man's backbone. This was enough to freeze the man in his tracks. Sam then walked the man over to the bunk where their first victim was tied up. Sam sat the man onto the bunk. With his left hand, he grabbed the man's hair at the back of his head. With a rough tug on the man's hair to tilt his head backward, Sam pushed the muzzle of the Tommy gun directly into the man's mouth with a shove. The man turned white with fear as his eyes popped wide open. With menace, Sam mockingly said, You speaky and G? The man grunted as he nodded. Sam stepped back as he pulled the muzzle of the Tommy gun out of the man's mouth. Sam noticed the man had a scar on his left cheek. Most likely, he received it in a knife fight at some time in the past. Sam asked, Okay, Scarface, where is everybody? The man answered, They all go to the village. Sam asked again, Why did they go to the village? The man answered, they make big party. Sam asked again, What party? The man hesitated. Sam growled, Listen Scarface, if you don't tell me what I want to know, I am going to blow the top of your head off. The man shook with fear. Sam pointed the submachine gun directly at Scarface's head. Sam yelled, Talk, and make it good. The man began to speak. The boss made a big score. One rich buyer, he come. We load much opium on the boat. Then they all go to village have big party get drunk and get many bitches? Sam asked, what boat? Scarface replied, the boss he have motorboat, like in the war. Big motors, go fast. Sam asked, you mean like a patrol boat? Scarface nodded, yes, two machine guns rat tat tat go fast. Sam threw a look of concern toward Chung. Chung nodded. Sam asked, how many guards at the farm? Scarface replied, not a lot. Most go to village to get drunk and screw hookers. Sam asked, the man, he is still alive? Scarface seemed to be confused. Sam asked again, Where is the man that your boss is holding for ransom? Scarface replied, Oh, him. He is locked up in the big house. He is good. One time I bring him food. He not harmed. Sam asked, When is your boss coming back? Scarface said, I not sure. Maybe today. Maybe tomorrow. I don't know. Sam had realized that they had hit it lucky. Most of the bad guys were out getting drunk and the opium farm was lightly guarded. Sam asked, What's in those 55-gallon drums outside? Scarface said, Gas for the boat. A plan was forming in Sam's mind. As if he could read Sam's mind, Chung started to round up their bad guys. Pointing at the bad guy who was tied up on the bunk, Sam said, Get him dressed. Get these monkeys to load the gas onto the truck. We are going to pay a visit. I expect that there is going to be a hot time in the old town tonight. Chung began to hustle the three men outside. Chung had seen Sam in this mood before. When Sam got an idea in his mind, it was like Moses parting the Red Sea. It was almost divine. A look of divine insight would appear upon Sam's face. He would walk around as if he was in a trance. To say the least, it was scary shit. Outside the gas was loaded on the truck. Chung sat in the back of the truck with the 55-gallon drums and two of the bad guys. The two men were securely tied up. Chung sat across from them balancing his M, one carbine upon his knee. The muzzle of his rifle was pointed directly at the two men. Sam and Scarface sat in the front of the truck. Scarface drove while Sam covered him with his Tommy gun. The dirt road was rough. The old truck bounced around as they traveled. It was about the middle of the morning when Sam caught sight of the opium farm. Sam ordered Scarface to pull over and stop. The day had turned out to be sunny and hot full of blue sky. Sam could hear the buzz of the insects as they warmed themselves in the sun. This was hot and dry land. With some irrigation, this would be an ideal place for a poppy farm. Also, there was nobody around to disturb you. Sam remembered his history. As he viewed the poppy farm, Sam remembered that places like this drove the economic engine of the opium trade. Places like this were part and parcel of the opium wars. It was the reason why the British had gained control of Hong Kong at the end of the opium wars. Sam ordered Scarface to drive closer to the farm so that he could get a better look. Off into the distance, Sam noticed a woman in the field gathering the sap from the flowers. She stood waist high in the pretty flowers. She was a dark skinned woman. Her dark skin seemed to shine in the bright sun. She wore a simple blue cloth dress which hung lazily across her right shoulder. Her long black hair moved under the influence of the breeze. Upon her face was a contented smile. She took no notice of the truck. There were the four buildings as Susie's stepsister had described. There was a bunkhouse, a barn, 
and a residence. Also, there was the big square building where they probably refined the poppy sap into opium. It occurred to Sam that they were making more than opium. In these days, there was a lucrative market in heroin as well. From Sam's vantage point, the place seemed deserted. Sam ordered Scarface to drive. He pointed the Tommy gun at Scarface's ear. Sam ordered, get this shitbox into third gear, and you drive to the front door of that house. Scarface did what he was ordered to do. He got the truck into third, and he floored the accelerator. Sam called to Chung who was in the back of the truck, guarding the two men. Get ready. We are going in. The truck zoomed up to the front door of the residence, and Sam hopped out of the truck. His boots made a crunching sound in the dry dirt. He quickly ran to the driver's side of the truck and ordered Scarface to get out. At the same time, Chung hopped out of the back of the truck. Using the familiar truck, they were able to drive right up to the front door without even being noticed. Both Sam and Chung looked around with surprise to see that no one had even noticed them yet. Sam got behind Scarface and told him to walk. Pointing his Tommy gun at Scarface's back, Sam walked him up to the front door. Sam nodded to Chung as to say get ready. Chung stood at Sam's right as he shouldered his rifle. Sam ordered Scarface to knock upon the door. At first, no one answered. With some prodding of the muzzle of the Tommy gun, Scarface then pounded upon the door. The door opened to reveal a man dressed in black silk pajamas. With a stunned look upon his face he asked in Chinese, What is this? Who are you? Sam and Chung forced their way into the house. With his rifle pointed at the man in pajamas, Chung sat him down into a chair. Chung asked in Chinese, Where is Li Wong? With the muzzle of an M, one pointed directly at the man's forehead. He said, He is in the bedroom in the back. Sam said to Chung, Watch these two. Sam went into the interior of the house as Chung placed the two men under guard. As Sam went down the hallway, he opened each door looking for Li. When he reached a locked door, he called out, Li, are you in there? When he heard the sound of his old friend's voice, Sam was elated. Sam yelled, Stand away from the door, Li. I'm going to blast the lock open. Sam aimed the submachine gun at the lock and pulled the trigger. The 45 caliber gun made splinters of the door and lock. With a kick of his boot, Sam opened the bedroom door. There was Li Wong standing in the corner of the room. It had been more than 10 years since either man had seen each other. The two men paused to look at each other. Smiles appeared upon each man's face as they hugged his comrades. Sam said, You old bandit. It's good to see you again. The slight gray hair old man nodded in agreement. When Sam knew him, Li Wong was one of the most courageous freedom fighters in the Chinese underground. He and his comrades saved the lives of more than one American pilot. The effort against the Japanese was a ragtag affair, and a person in those days lived from day to day. The end could come at any time. These fighters put their lives on the line every time they went out on a mission. Needless to say, Sam had the highest respect for his old friend. Lee said, I knew that you would come. It's like the old days again when we ran around shooting at the bad guys. Isn't it Sam? The sentimental old man shed a tear as he hugged Sam again. Sam said, You bet. Now, we gotta get you out of here. Get yourself dressed. There is someone special waiting to meet you. Come on now. We must be quick. Lee asked, Who is waiting for me? Sam said, Your stepdaughter from America. She is waiting for you at the boat. At this news, Lee seemed to be invigorated. He quickly changed out of his pajamas, and he made himself ready to travel. At the time of his capture, he was wearing a white shirt, blue pants, and black shoes, and these were the clothes he changed into. The spunky old man came alive with excitement. It had been a long time since he had adventure like this, and Sam could see that now that he was here, Lee was ready to run. When Lee was fully dressed, Sam unloosened his gun belt which held his army colt. Sam said, Here old man, strap this on. It's time to kick some butt. Lee's face brightened into a glorious smile. He took the gun belt and strapped it on like an old professional. Then he said, You bet. The two men went out and entered the room where Chung was standing guard over the two gangsters. As Sam and Lee entered the room, Chung's face broke into a broad smile. Chung said, You got him. This is a good sign. And look at him. He is ready to fight. The three men laughed. Lee looked at the man who was sitting in the chair. This was the man who was Lee's guard. Lee walked over to the man who was sitting in the chair. He said in Chinese, Stand up. With a look of fear upon his face, the man stood in front of Lee. Lee said to Sam and Chung, Him? He is the one who insulted me. He is the one who betrayed me. Lee stepped closer to the man who was standing before him now. Without saying another word, Lee reached for the Colt 45 which was now strapped to his waist, and with it he delivered a swift and stinging blow to the man's forehead. The man crumbled into the chair. Lee looked at Sam and said, 
Now we can go, Sam said. First let me look around for a minute. Pointing at Scarface, Sam said, That one over there told me that these guys made a big score. Just let me look around. Maybe. You never know. The residence was arranged like a ranch house with all the rooms on one level. Sam went off looking for the room which looked like an office. When he found it, he quickly began to search it. He laid his Tommy gun down upon the desk. First he went through the desk to find nothing special. Next he tried the cabinets, and the result was the same. Sam sat at the desk and thought. He looked around the room. Then he arose from the desk chair and walked over to what looked like a closet. Opening the closet door, Sam found it. There it was as big as life. Tucked into one corner of the closet was a safe box. It was a good size box. It was about waist high, and it was as wide as a refrigerator. There was a good reason why Sam called Lee, you old bandit. Lee was one of the most skilled fighters. In those days in China, the underground fighters were obliged to make do with whatever was at hand. Money and supplies were always scarce. It was sometimes necessary to improvise. This meant sometimes that they had to beg, borrow, or steal what they needed. In wartime, you do what you must, and Lee had acquired some unusual skills. One of those skills was safe cracking. Sam called to Lee, Lee come in here. Lee stepped into the room, and he immediately saw what Sam was pointing at. Lee slowly approached the safe box as if it was alive. He appraised the box as if he was a doctor examining a patient. Lee said to Sam, it's been a long time since I have done this, but look here, it is an old box. It's not like the new ones. They are most complicated. This one I recognize. Lee kneeled in front of the safe and began to turn the dial. Lee asked for a water glass. Sam searched until he found one, and he handed it to Lee. In an unusual movement, Lee placed the open end of the glass to a particular spot on the door of the safe. Next, Lee placed his ear to the other end of the glass using it like a hearing aid. Lee began to turn the dial again. This continued for some time until Lee heard the correct clicks. A smile of success appeared upon Lee's face. He looked at Sam as he twirled the dial in the correct sequence. With a yank, he pulled upon the handle. The door opened. Lee stepped back so that Sam could examine the contents of the safe. Sam saw bundles of cash neatly arranged in the safe box. He didn't know exactly how much wealth was sitting there, but he knew that it was a lot. Sam said to Lee, Get something to carry it. We are going to take it with us. Lee replied, But Sam, it's blood money. Sam was moving in that special way. It was that look again. Sam would look as if he was entering a trance when these plans came to him. In the shack with Chung, the look first appeared. Now, with Lee, it was back again. Sam was going to leave his mark on these parasites. Sam said, I know. I intend to bleed these parasites with their own money. Besides, this money will do more good in our pockets. I'll get a pillowcase from the bedroom to carry it in. After filling the pillowcase with money, Sam and Lee returned to the room in which Chung was waiting. Sam stood there with his Tommy gun hanging loosely in his right hand. The sack of money was slung over his left shoulder. The safe box was picked clean. Sam said to Chung who was guarding Scarface and Pajama Man, Get those two monkeys to unload one of the 55-gallon drums and have them roll it up to the front door. Chung knew that it was going to happen now. He knew that it would be just a matter of time. Sam's plan was about to take form. Sam and the others went out of the front door. Chung set the men to work unloading one of the drums. Lee and Sam got into the front of the truck. Sam placed the sack of money on the seat between them. Lee sat in the driver's seat and waited for further orders from Sam. Once the drum was placed at the front door of the house, Chung and the two men climbed into the back of the truck to join the two men who were tied there. By now, Chung knew what the plan was. They were going to give these guys a big hot foot. Sam told Lee to drive to the building which was supposed to be the factory. Once there, Chung had the men unload another drum, and they placed it in front of the building. Next, they went off into the field. The truck went bouncing along into the middle of the nearest field. Among the flowers, the truck looked ridiculous as it bounced around. The remaining drum was pushed out of the back of the truck. By now, Lee figured out the plan. The old man laughed out loud as he stepped upon the gas pedal. The truck made a large circle around the last drum so that Sam could blast it with his Tommy gun. As they came near the drum, Sam yelled out, Hurrah! While pointing the gun out of the passenger window, Sam pulled the trigger and the 45 caliber gun began to rip the drum apart. The hot lead ignited the gas, and an explosive bright orange flame burst into the air. Like a delivery truck, they drove by the house and the factory. As they came close, Sam aimed at the drums which contained the gas. Just like the first drum, the gas exploded causing a fireball. The dry wood of the buildings went up like a match stick. In the factory building, secondary explosions could be heard. Hearing the explosions, 
a small group of men came running out of the bunkhouse firing their guns at the truck as it came driving by. Lee tossed a serious look at Sam as he drove the truck around in a circle. Sam seemed to agree without saying a word. The truck came around again, and Sam opened up upon the men who were firing at them. The men weren't expecting so much firepower. The Tommy gun roared, and the small group of men fell to the ground seeking cover. At the same time, Chung began tossing men out the back of the truck. One by one, they bounced upon the ground. Each man ran for his life as Chung opened up with his M1. The house, the factory, and the field were in flames now. The breeze would do the rest. With so much fire, it would be just a matter of time before the remaining buildings would catch fire. The truck made one more circle before it headed down the road away from the compound. As they left the burning compound, Sam, Lee, and Chung had one last look. It would be something that they would all remember. The truck pulled up to the edge of the landing. Sam, Lee, and Chung jumped out. Sam had told Lee to drive onto the dock and to leave the truck in neutral. They had driven all the way down the road from the farm without incident. They were at the little landing. There was the shack and the dock. Just like before, there was no one around. The truck sat with its nose pointing at the river. The three men gave the truck a push and into the river it plunged with a loud splash. It was afternoon now and it was time to get back to the Hornet. Sam knew that Susie was wading down river with the rowboat. Sam said, let's get the hell out of here. Lee, you follow us. Chung, you carry the money sack. At that, they set off to meet up with Susie. There was nothing to say. The three men made their way through the bushes until they saw Susie sitting on the prow of the rowboat. The shotgun lay across her lap as she stood guard. Sam waved at Susie. The three men broke into a trot as they hustled over to where Susie and the boat were waiting. Sam said, Susie, this is Lee Wong, your stepfather. Stepfather and stepdaughter confronted each other. Lee said, you are a beautiful young woman. You are more beautiful than in your pictures. Susie said, I have been told much about you. I have been told that you were a very courageous soldier in the war, and you have brought high honor to our family. Lee said, you have helped to save my life. You, my daughter, have also brought high honor to our family. With that, the two embraced. The spunky old man turned sentimental as he hugged his stepdaughter for the first time. Susie noticed a tear in Lee's eye, and she too became sentimental. Sam interrupted, you two can get more acquainted later. For now, we gotta get moving. I'm expecting a gang of bad guys to show up anytime now. Time is wasting. With that, everybody boarded the rowboat and made their way to the Hornet. The trip across the river was easier than Sam expected. When they came this way before, Sam being a soldier was aware of the exposure the little boat presented. Especially since they would be sitting ducks out here on the river if anybody was to be shooting at them, but there was no need to be worried. They had gotten away cleanly at least for now. Aboard the Hornet, they all changed back into their disguises. Even Lee looked like a fisherman. On deck, Sam gave the order to get underway. The crew scrambled about the deck, taking in the moorings. The engine came to life, and the Hornet moved into the main channel of the river. Aided by the current, the Hornet made good progress on its way down the river. Spirits were high among the adventurers. However, Sam knew that this wasn't over yet. He knew that those gangsters were going to be pissed big time when they got home. Sam knew that if they didn't get out of here in a hurry, there would be trouble. Those guys weren't going to take this shit without a fight. The Hornet cruised down river. They had been underway for about four or five hours now, and they were approaching civilization. Small craft appeared upon the river, and signs of life were apparent on either bank of the river. The sun was making its exit for the day, and a rainbow of color broke across the horizon. Just when Sam thought that they were going to get away with it, he saw it. Coming up the river was the patrol boat that Scarface had described. She was about 75 foot long, and she was painted a dull gray. Mounted on each side of her foredeck were two 50 caliber machine guns. On her afterdeck, there mounted was a 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. After seeing her, Sam exclaimed, Shit! Sam's call brought the others up on deck to take a look. Sam wished that they were further down the river. There they would have gotten lost among the many other fishing junks. Being this far up the river, they would be conspicuous. Sam said to the others, Remember the drill. Everybody smile and wave as they go by. Giving the right of way, the Hornet moved to the starboard as the patrol boat went to the port. As the patrol boat passed, Sam and the others began to wave as they smiled broadly. Sam said, They see us. Susie asked, what do you mean? We look like fishermen. Why should they be suspicious? Sam replied, We are a little too far up the river to be a deep sea fishing boat. When those guys get home, they are going to remember us. Susie asked, So, what do we do? Sam replied, 
we make a run for it. And that was the plan. The Hornet entered the part of the river where they could set the sails for the journey home. They still had some distance before they would be in the bay, but if they were lucky, they could get lost among the fishing boats. Still, there was a long trip ahead, and they weren't out of danger. Night fell, and the Hornet quietly slipped out of the harbor. She was making for the open ocean and safety. Sam set the sea watch, and the others all went to bed after an evening meal. They had had a big day, and they were all fatigued. Sam retired to his cabin. His cabin was the most luxurious of them all. It was larger than the others. It was decorated in a decidedly masculine way. There was room for a little mahogany desk, a closet, and a good size bed. It also had its own porthole which let in a nice breeze. On the dark brown paneled walls, there were decorations of his past exploits as a United States Marine. In the nude, Sam lay in his bed. A chiming clock struck the hour. It was about two o'clock in the morning, and Sam heard a soft knock upon his cabin door. Sam saw the door open a bit, and Susie's pretty face appeared. Her long, shiny black hair was combed loosely. In her dark almond-shaped eyes, a warm glow was shining. Susie whispered, Sam, are you asleep? Come in please, I'm awake, Sam replied. Seeing that Sam was awake, Susie slipped into the cabin. She stood smiling as she gazed upon Sam. Sam's eyes moved across her. She wore a pair of emerald green pajamas. Her pretty long black hair hung down across her shoulders. The top buttons of her pajamas were loosened to reveal her deep cleavage. As she stood there barefoot, Sam noticed every little detail of her. Susie said, Well, I guess you're not asleep. Do you mind if I join you? Susie moved to the bed, went close and whispered, Screw me, baby. And that is what Sam did. They made love until they were exhausted. Sam awoke to the sound of a heavy pounding upon his cabin door. Sam recognized Chung's voice. Sam, get up. We got trouble. Susie's eyes popped open with the sound of Chung's voice. Susie asked, What is it? Sam said, I'm not sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if those gangsters are on our tail. You get dressed. Sam and Susie jumped out of bed. Although Sam had only a few hours sleep, he came wide awake with the rush of adrenaline which hit him with full force. Sam was expecting this. He knew that those gangsters would suspect them. If only they had reached the harbor before they were spotted by the patrol boat. Being that far up the river, they would be prime suspects in that seagoing fishing boats rarely travel that part of the river. There was no need for a disguise now. Sam knew that they were in for it. Sam appeared upon the main deck, wearing his combat fatigues. Chung had been up at dawn, and he had been standing watch. He too expected that those gangsters might make a fight of it. Hearing all the commotion, Lee came up to the main deck to see what the matter was. Right behind him, Susie followed. Sam stood on the stern looking through Chung's binoculars. On the horizon, a little gray dot appeared. Lee asked, What is it? Sam said, It's them. Lee asked, How did they find us? Sam turned to address the little group. They know that we have you, Lee. They also know that the only safe place for you would be Hong Kong. All they had to do was to set a course for Hong Kong. I figured that it would take some time for them to get back to their farm and to realize what happened. Actually, I didn't expect them until some time this afternoon. Susie asked, What made you think that? Sam replied, Well, we dumped their truck into the river, and it seemed that there was no way to get back to the farm except by walking. They either had another vehicle, or they had a radio transmitter. Either way, we are in for a fight. Lee asked, What do we do? Sam said, We gotta jump on them, but they are a lot faster than us. There is no way in this world that we can outrun them. We are at least a day's sail or more from Bongo Strait and No Name Island, or we could have hidden there. Chung muttered, Ah shit. Lee and Susie turned to Chung expecting clarification. Chung said, He's talking about Rocky Bottom. He's going to lead them in there so that they will be wrecked on the rocks. Lee and Susie asked, Aren't we going to be wrecked ourselves? Chung replied, He thinks that he knows the way through Rocky Bottom without getting wrecked. He is going to zigzag through the rocks hoping that those guys will make a mistake. Lee looked around to see nothing but open water and the coast off into the distance. Lee asked, Where is this place, Sam? Sam replied as he pointed off to the port bow, There. Lee said, But Sam, there is nothing there but water. Sam said again, Look at the coast in the distance. That is where our landmarks are. We will come in close to the coast, and using the landmarks we will thread our way through. Besides, we have another surprise for them. And that was the plan. Sam gave the order to make for the coast, so that he could line up the Hornet into good position. Unknown to anybody else, Sam had talked Chung to doing this crazy thing. Sam had gotten one of those ideas which caused another of those trance-like looks to appear upon his face. 
Chung had become aware of the consequences of that look when Sam was cooking up one of his plans. Sam and Chung had sailed out to Rocky Bottom on a slack tide. With the sea at its lowest ebb tide, Sam made a chart of the rocks in the bay. He studied his chart until he found a way through the sound without being wrecked. Sam had discovered the channel of safe passage. He committed it to memory knowing that maybe someday it would come in handy. The day that Sam had prepared for was this day, and he was going to lead those guys a merry chase through one of the most dangerous areas of the Chinese coast. Often referred as a ship's graveyard, Rocky Bottom Sound was loaded with jagged rocks which pointed upward like teeth. On a full tide, none of these rocks were visible to the eye. At the ebb tide, the place was frightening. The Hornet pulled onto a strong tack as it headed straight for the coastline. The Hornet was just south of Rocky Bottom Sound's southern boundary. Sam had to get the Hornet lined up at the entrance of the channel, or it would be all over. In addition, the patrol boat with its crew of gangsters was closing on them quickly. It was a race now. Sam was hoping that those guys didn't know about Rocky Bottom because it didn't appear on the charts. In fact, these places didn't even have real names. Places like Bongo Straits and No Name Island and Rocky Bottom were names which were made up by Sam and Chung so that they could navigate these uncharted waters. Only the local fishermen knew their way through these waters safely. Watching the local fishermen gave Sam the idea. If someone knew his way around, it could be very useful. The day was sunny and warm. It was a typical tropical day. The seas were running in Sam's favor. The Hornet being a large seagoing junk slipped through the waves nicely. Most of all, the tide was at its highest on this morning and the breeze would be right for making a run through Rocky Bottom. Sam felt confident. The conditions were almost perfect for what Sam was about to attempt. With the high tide, the Hornet would glide through Rocky Bottom with apparent ease. The guys who were chasing them would never see the danger. Sam began to issue orders. Sam said, Lee, you go with Chung. Susie, you stay with me. Chung, you set two crewmen at the bow as spotters. Tell them to look out for rocks. Tell them to sing out as we approach them. I'll take the helm. Chung, it's time to give our friends who are following us our little surprise. Sam took the wheel. Susie stood beside him. Chung firstly set the bow watch as Sam ordered, and he took Lee below. Chung led Lee to a cabin in the stern of the Hornet. The cabin was situated just below the main deck. Lee and Chung stood outside of the cabin as Chung unlocked the door. As they entered the cabin, Lee's eyes popped with surprise. What he saw there set him back. Lee asked, where in the world did you guys ever get one of those? Lee was now standing in a large, almost square cabin which opened to the sea. At the very stern of the Hornet, the cabin had an array of windows which wrapped around the entire back of the junk. The windows were set upon tracks so that they could be opened to give a 180-degree access to the sea behind them. Set directly in the middle of the cabin was a three-inch gun. It was mounted on tracks so that it could be run out just like the old pirate ships. However, this wasn't some old pirate cannon. This was a modern three-inch gun which Sam and Chung had bought on the black market. It had come off the deck of a World War II destroyer. It was a deadly bit of business. From the deck to the overhead, the cabin walls contained racks of ammunition for the gun. Wherever Lee looked there were the points of the three-inch shells. Chung replied, Sam has his ways. Once he gets an idea in his brain, then stand back. Lee said, I know what you mean. He was like that when he was with the Flying Tigers. Chung said, help me with the gun. I'll tell you what to do and we'll give those guys who are after you a bit of hell. Chung slid the windows open. Then, with Lee's help, they pushed the big gun into firing position. The muzzle of the gun poked out of the cabin's rear opening like a clenched fist. Chung got behind the gun and began to adjust the trajectory. He threw open the breech of the gun, and then he motioned to Lee. Lee retrieved one of the three-inch shells, and together, they loaded the gun. On the main deck, Sam was steering the Hornet to the precise point of entry of Rocky Bottom Sound. Sam said to Susie, go to my cabin, get my binoculars, then look in my desk. In the bottom left draw, there is a chart of Rocky Bottom. Hurry now, those guys are getting close now. Susie ran off to do what Sam asked. The stage was set now. Looking over his shoulder, Sam could see the patrol boat. There was no doubt in Sam's mind now. They were definitely after them. The one thing that wasn't in Sam's favor was that they were alone out here today. Sam had hoped to catch a break in that there would be other fishing junks out here today. If there were, they may have been mistaken for one of them instead. Susie returned with the binoculars and the chart. Sam said, you keep your eyes on that coast, and when I ask, you tell me what you see. Also, I want you to hold that chart so that I can see it. Susie nodded, and she made herself ready. Sam yelled out, here we go. With that, Sam brought the wheel hard over, and the hornet hauled over onto her starboard side. Sam prayed that he hit the turn correctly. 
If he didn't, the game was all over. Sam began to yell in an excited voice. Susie immediately understood what Sam needed. Susie began to describe the coast so that Sam could find his landmarks. There was no going back now. They were committed. It was all or nothing. The patrol boat with its load of gangsters was coming on at full speed, and they were closing quickly now. As the Hornet made its northerly swing, the patrol boat became visible to Chung and Lee who were waiting in the cabin below. Chung took careful aim as he saw the patrol boat's twin machine guns which were mounted on the foredeck light up. Chung knew that they were under attack, and he knew that now was the time to open fire. The patrol boat came straight on as if they had no fear of return fire. As far as those guys were concerned, the Hornet was just an old fishing boat. They were about to find out otherwise. With the first volley of the three-inch gun, the Hornet shook from stem to stern. The roar of the big gun was deafening. The first shot was online, but the patrol boat's speed caused the shell to explode behind the target. At that, the patrol boat quickly veered away. Chung laughed vigorously. That got their attention. The men on the patrol boat were so surprised that it took some time before they understood what had happened. The boat veered away and almost came around in a circle. This gave the Hornet just enough time to enter Sam's channel. On the main deck, Sam hearing the volley of the big gun yelled, Hurrah! Sam yanked the steering wheel from side to side as the Hornet seemed to zigzag through the water. The patrol boat made another run at them. Below, Chung and Lee reloaded the big gun. The speedy boat was a difficult target. Chung fired again trying to compensate for the speed of the boat. This time the shell fell short exploding in a flash of orange fire and black smoke. The shell came close enough to cause the boat to veer again. The men on the patrol boat knew that they couldn't take even one of those shots from the big gun. One hit, and it would be all over for them. Knowing this, the commander of the boat was more cautious now. The boat made another run at the Hornet. This time the boat tried a zigzag approach. Chung was expecting something like this. He and Lee began to reload as quickly as possible. As soon as the shell was pushed into the gun, the gun blasted another round at the oncoming boat. The shells exploded all around the target. The fireballs and black smoke of the exploding shells was enough to put the fear of God into the crew on the patrol boat. With both vessels zigzagging around, it looked like some kind of a deadly dance. The shells from the big gun came faster now, and the captain of the patrol boat lost his courage as he fell back again. The patrol boat retreated to a safer distance. It was as if they were having second thoughts. Chung knew that if they made another run at them, they would come all the way this time. They would try to board them. If that happened, it would be down to hand-to-hand -hand combat. Up on the main deck, Sam was yanking the Hornet from side to side, slipping through the rocks. Chung had set the bow watch as Sam had directed. The two men at the bow were now singing out as they were directed, and they were also screaming out with terror as the jagged rocks passed by. Susie turned to see Sam smiling. Sam was the only person who knew the truth. His plan had worked. Susie asked, Do you think this is funny? Sam began to laugh. I think that this is a pisser. Did you see that last landmark which we just passed? It means that if they want us they have to come in here to get us. It means that we've got them. It was down to this. If the gangsters who kidnapped Lee wanted him and the sack of money back, they were going to have to fight for them. Apparently the captain of the patrol boat had made his decision. As Chung and Lee looked out of the windows of the aft cabin, they saw the patrol boat come at them again. Both machine guns were blasting as the boat reached full speed. They were coming in for the kill. Chung and Lee set themselves to work manning the gun. The big gun boomed time after time. The speedy boat seemed to slip past the explosions of the shells which were being thrown at them. On the main deck, Sam saw it coming. Sam said to Susie, Here it comes. Maybe you don't want to watch? Susie said, I want to watch. And that is just what she did. Sam and Susie watched the high-speed patrol boat enter the southern boundary of Rocky Bottom Sound. The men on the boat entered without any idea of what lay ahead. Below in the cabin, Chung stopped firing the gun. He stood beside Lee and placed his hand on Lee's shoulder as he gazed out across the water. The look on his face told Lee the story. The two men stood as they watched. It was as if a clock was ticking off the seconds in slow motion. Thinking that the big gun had run out of ammunition, the patrol boat laid in a direct course toward the Hornet. Flying across the water at top speed and with both her guns blasting, the patrol boat suddenly hit something hard. She came to a sudden stop. As she hit, she made a terrible thunk. As the boat began to rip herself apart, she cried like a woman screaming in torment. Her bow nosed downward into the sea. Incredibly, the 75-foot boat stood on its prow, and it then flipped over. She lay capsized on the surface of the water. A huge hole was ripped open in her hull from her bow to amidships. She floated there for some time, 
and she then exploded into a great orange fireball. From the force of the explosion, the hull was then turned into burning splinters which were hurled into the air. As the sound of the explosion dissipated, the fiery fragments fell back into the sea with a plop. On the Hornet, Sam, Susie, Chung, and Lee stood and watched. There was a moment of silence. Each person was alone with their thoughts. Susie was the first one to speak. It's all over, isn't it Sam? Sam replied, we still have to get out of here, but it's over. Sam continued to navigate the Hornet through Rocky Bottom. Later on, the four adventurers would recall that Sam's plan was a good one. The Hornet made it through the dangerous stretch of water. Sam's ability at the helm was uncanny. After the threat was gone, Sam steered the Hornet through Rocky Bottom with ease. Soon, they were back out on the open sea where they could set a course for home. There are moments which come to be significant in a person's life. Forces come together in unknown ways. When this happens, the people involved become bonded together forever. This is the stuff which creates lifetime friendships. Sam, Chung, Lee and Susie came together in just such a way. From a friendship which was made in a war-torn part of China, a series of events were set in motion. Sam Kincaid's life was saved by Li Wong in the struggle with the Japanese. In the Chinese way, the favor was returned when Sam Kincaid saved Li Wong's life in a struggle with a gang of cutthroats. Out of the force of love and friendship, a pretty young Eurasian woman traveled across an ocean to become involved in a struggle of life and death. Susie Benton showed unusual courage as she was swept along with the currents of change. Having studied Eastern philosophy, Cheng Lo may have been the only participant who understood the forces of change which would encompass them all. The four adventurers sailed into Hong Kong Harbor knowing that their lives were forever changed. Sam and Chung would go on to become wealthy men in the shipping business. Susie Benton would return to America to wait for her stepfather. Li Wong would use his share of the money which Sam and he had liberated from the gangsters to arrange safe passage out of China for Jade Wong. Li and his daughters would then start a successful business in the J trade when they made a home in San Francisco. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.